Welcome to the Chris Spangle Show. My name is Chris Spangle. It's so great to have you here with us today. And I am looking forward to this conversation. I am dangerously close to completing the book, uh, but I got about halfway through the Dignity Revolution, and I thought, I've got to talk to Daniel Darling, who is the Senior Vice President for Communications at NRB. Uh, and you, you've written several books, Daniel, like I Faith, Activist Faith, The Original Jesus. Uh, your newest book is Away With Words, Using Our Online Conversations for Good, which we'll talk a little bit about. Uh, but The Dignity Revolution was a book that I guess has been foundational to my worldview and my politics. I tend to use the word empathy. And you articulated dignity in a way that I hadn't considered that that was the word. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I know it's not a new word, but can you talk about the dignity revolution? Just give us a little insight into what it is and what is dignity. Well, it's interesting. Um, yeah, the, the concept of human dignity, it, it's the idea that um, every person, every human being has intrinsic worth and value. Uh, regardless of their utility, regardless of what of their skill set or what they bring to society. Now, um, we talked about this in the in the uh, we were talking before we went on the air, but I believe the 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 Christian gospel gives the as I articulated in the Dignity Revolution the fullest and most robust vision of what it means to be human and about human dignity. Um, so like, and I actually think you can make an argument that um, concepts of dignity, they're out there. I mean, I, I, I don't think it's just Christians today that are kind of using that language and talking about it, but I think it all borrows from Christianity. Uh, Tim Keller gave a really great speech to I think the House of Lords or, or Parliament or something in in the UK last year, a couple of years ago, where he made that case, um, and I think historians have done that, like Tom Holland and others. Uh, so that's the case I make, and for so far, Christian, the vision of human dignity is much more robust and thick and comprehensive than I think the language that sometimes people use. If that makes sense. Yeah, when you look at the the value of life from let's say the birth of Jesus to now, although it feels like we're in a very brutal time sometimes and there are some, there's ugliness. When you read about Roman society or the clans that ruled Britain uh, before uh, Romans invaded there or the Roman society, the Greek society, in it, you see an arc of empathy start to greatly increase and the valuation of not just life itself but the life of marginalized people um you know if you look at just between 120 years ago and youth and uh, eugenics programs you know i'm in a state in indiana that championed some of those programs versus now it, it would be incomprehensible unless you're in in some brutal societies like the uyghurs in china i mean as you've studied history for the book, I mean, do you see that same arc? Am I right in that assumption? Uh, you know, I think it's interesting when you talk about arcs of history. I think, um, you know, there's a there's a common perception among us in the modern era of, you know, I like I think chronological snobbery has seeped into everybody's yeah. pores, whether we realize it or not. And I think there's this common perception. It's, it's kind of the myth of progress that we are advancing and we are better than the previous generations. And in, and in some measures, human flourishing is better. I mean, in some measures, if you just look around the world, even though there's a lot of deep brokenness and injustice and evil, you know, poverty has been cut significantly. Life expectancy is, is higher medical advances, all these things. Um, and yet the idea that there's this arc or arc of progress, I, I don't think is accurate. I think, you know, th things go more in cycles um, from a Christian perspective. 
you know, if you think about Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. So there's, there's progress in many ways, but then there's also new ways to assault human dignity. There's new ways to, to kill people. There's, you know, you think of the 20th century, you know, in terms of advancement from the beginning to end, probably not a century in human history that had so much advancement and yet so much uh, evil and death and horror. So I think it's a little bit of chronological, chronological stomberty to say that we're smarter, we're better people. Um, I, I actually dislike when people talk about being on the right side of history. You know, I think uh, I'd rather be as a Christian on the right side of Jesus, on the right side of, you know, what is right. Uh, and I think that chronological summary keeps us from seeing evils in our day and, and, and kind of also ha- causes us to look backward and with disdain on anybody who lived before the present era. That So I think we have to be careful about that. I don't know if that answers your question. No, 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 totally. A, a, I, I, a filibuster. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. Um, maybe the, uh, the next place to start is the Horton Hears a Who story, because I think it is so foundational to the entire book. Can you talk about the influence that Horton Hears a Who had on you? Well, um, I had been thinking about these issues about human dignity because I've always been fascinated by, by really there was two motivations going into writing this book. One, I've always been fascinated, fascinated by the rich language that the Bible uses to describe what it means to be human. I mean, if you just think about this, Genesis opens up with Moses saying that God spoke into existence the whole creation. But then Moses pauses his narration, slows down and says that um, God, he uses language that God reaches with his hand and sculpts humans from the dust of the ground. And then there's this great deliberation among the, the Trinity. Let us make man in our image that you don't see this kind of deliberation and care with any other kind of human. Oh, I'm sorry, with any other kind of cr- part of creation. And then you have Psalm 139, which the care that God has knit each person in human. So like the, the rich language always intrigued me about the, the vision that Christianity has for what it means to be human. Even, even when you go fast forward to the resurrection and that God has in Christ, not just redeeming our souls, but redeeming our bodies. It's just fascinating. Paul talks through that in, in his letters. Uh, so that, it, that was a motivation. And then the other motivation was, you know, I, I have kind of been, my entrance into politics started with the pro-life movement and, and the pro-life movement introduced the moral vocabulary into the society that the least defensible among us is worthy of dignity and respect. So those two things were kind of catalyzing in my mind, but I I was actually at a, I was at a, uh, a kids theater thing with my kids. My mom, my wife actually, forced me to go take some time off. You need to go. Our kids homeschool things going with it. So we went, we sat there and I was prepared to just be bored and just use my phone and just scroll and whatever, check ESPN or check whatever Twitter. Um, but I had read Horton, you know, to our kids and stuff, but like see it, seeing it on the stage and that line of a person's a person, no matter how small is just a powerful line. So I went and did some research and figured out like what was going through Dr. Seuss's mind. Then I uncovered the story of, of Dr. Seuss. And I didn't realize that, as I talk about in the book, that during World War II, he was a patriot. He was, he was um, writing cartoons to back the Allied cause against the, the Nazis, against the fascists in, in Italy, you know, and trying to do his patriotic duty. And he did that through the use of cartoons. His cartoons appeared in magazines and newspapers all over at a time when editorial cartoons had significant influence, you know, before this visual age of streaming and internet and social media and all that. Um, Even really kind of before that, the real age of TV. Yeah. Um, So they had significant influence and he um, wrote these cartoons, but then a lot of his cartoons went beyond patriotism. And he at a time when, they were fairly toward. ugly. I mean, they were they were very ugly, racist. You know, racist. I mean, they, I mean they're, let's call them what they were. They're against Japanese and, people specifically. Yeah, at a time when when anti Japanese sentiment was at its highest after Pearl Harbor, when we, you know, the U.S. interned Japanese Americans, it was very ugly. These cartoons, very racist, depicting them as less than human beings. Um, but it's interesting. Something changed in him. 
So he, he, his real name is Theodore Giesel. And he had written all these. Well, after the war, he got a chance to tour Japan. And he got to see up close and personal the people that he had considered and depicted as less than human. And his whole perspective changed. He saw humanity in the people he thought were less than human. And so he, he wrote Horton, Here's a Who, as an apology. You know, he apologized in the only way he knew how, how, to, how to do, where he, he wrote Horton, Here's a Who, and, and that line, a person's a person no matter how small. So that was fun. That was inter interesting to me because I think it does show that uh, that embodied experience, him seeing people in person, he saw their humanity in a way he never did before. He had to, and, and I think that, that, you know, that to me is a way that when there's a people group we don't see, when there's a group of people that we don't consider as human or that we are tempted to dehumanize, but seeing them and having an experience up close really ch can change our mind. Yeah. And you then apply this, you mm -hmm. know, to racism, abortion, immigration, poverty, the dignity of work. I mean, you, it's in some ways a, having grown up in a Christian conservative white suburban town, you know, coming from that Republican background, you read through the book and there are parts of it where, you know, that, that, native part of me, I guess, goes right on, right? Like the abortion section, the pro-life section, I'm like, mm -hmm. right. But then there's the the racism parts and, and the immigration parts and some of that stuff that I find a lot of my hometown would be challenged by, that very Christian conservative hometown. So in some ways, it's a political book. In some ways, I don't feel like it's a political book at all. It's really about looking at every single person that you interact with as if they're God's creation, because they are, and really applying the gospel to common identity groups that we sort of pick apart and fight over. Is that a fair assessment of the book? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I try to give, and again, I could, probably could have picked 10 more issues to put in there. <laughs> um, I try to give a vision of what it means, what human dignity means. Um, you know, how do we think about ourselves and how do we think about our neighbors? Because, you know, there's a, there's a couple ways to, to think about it. On the one hand, if we really believe what the Bible says about what it means to be human, then it changes the way we see our neighbors, right? Um, the people we're tempted to not see, like if, if we're to love our neighbor as ourselves and we have the, we have a voice and a vote and we can, we can shape policy that affects our neighbors. We should, we should use that. Uh, we're tempted to not see people like the person on the road walking on the road to Jericho. Uh, we can walk by that, that man on the road to Jericho that we don't want to see at the same time. You know, there are some, uh, the, 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 the biblical concept of human dignity also changes the way we see ourselves, which is really informs the way we think about human sexuality, that, that we are not our own, that we, uh, we're created by a creator in his image that um, he has given us a purpose and he's designed us for a purpose um, that that he, the creator knows best what's best for our flourishing better than we do, which is why God's design for human sexuality and gender and all that is better than we can we can create for ourselves. And I, I, I just think, you know, this is. Um, this is a like a foundational thing that we need to understand. I also think it affects the, like I wanted to do a chapter on work because I think it affect one of the most intrinsic things about being human is, is work that, that we have been given this mandate to create, to um, that our work is not a curse. Our work is something, a good gift from God. And it affects the way we think about poverty and all those. Issues. Yeah. Tell, tell the story about your father and the pipes. Yeah, so my dad is a plumber. Uh, he's just retired from plumbing uh, last year. And he would drag me out to the job site to to help him on construction site. And uh, like I hate, a lot of times I hated going, but he made me go, you know, it's in Chicago. So in the winter during Christmas vacation, all my friends are playing video games and I'm putting on three layers of clothes and 
freezing my tail off out there. But it was actually so good for me to learn the value of hard work. And it really shaped me. Like I think about all the things that shaped me. And that's one of the foundational things. But my dad really took a lot of pride in his work. Um, he didn't read books like the Digny revolution. He didn't, he didn't study from the work and faith movement. Uh, but he took great pride in his work and, you know, he's installing plumbing in a house. He's installing pipes inside a wall that's going to be covered up. And I would get so impatient with him because he wanted to make sure things were almost perfect. And I'd just be like, dad, let's just go. That's good enough. Let's just go. And he's like, I'm like, no one's ever going to see this. And he would just say, no, uh, people aren't going to see it, but God's going to see it. It was just a very simple thing that expresses this very robust doctrine of creation. You know, my dad probably could not write a book on the doctrine of creation, but he expressed it in the way they did his work, that God sees our work, that our work is not just a means to an end. It's not just a way to get a paycheck. It is. It's not just a way to you know, have a Christian witness in the, in our workplace. It's not just a way to fund Christian ministry. It could be all those things or to provide for our families, but the work itself matters uh, because it's an intrinsic part of being human. So I thought that was important to have in there. Uh, to, and, I, and I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about work even now. I mean, there's been a really burgeoning work and faith movement in the church that I'm really excited about, you know, places like Acton Institute and other places, uh, center, uh, you know, Tom Nelson's work with his organization on uh, uh, Made to Flourish. But still, the average layperson, I think, thinks that his Monday through Friday work is really not kingdom work, that that's on Sunday. And what I'm trying to do is let people know that part of obeying God is doing really good work and creating good things. I, I want to touch on racism because you led with that in the book. Was that a, an intentional decision? And how does human dignity apply to issues of race? Well, it, it's very simple. I mean, one of the images that's enduring to me is Martin Luther King when he's marching with the sanitation workers in Memphis and they all have sandwich board signs that, signs that said, I am a man. And the, um, the whole uh, idea of that is to say, can you see me as more than a machine as a cog in the wheel that I have, can you see my humanity? And if you listen to Martin Luther King's speeches and talks, he references the language of human dignity so much, not, not just when talking about, um, you know, talking about African-Americans and talking about the, uh, the black uh, community that was oppressed, but also even talking about the segregationists that it's a, it's a assault on their dignity to continue to not see the dignity of those that they oppressed, that there's an equal wound on both sides. And um, I think when it comes to race, that's, that's at the very basic nature that um, to see, to see someone as valuable and worthy. And it's interesting the way the Bible talks about race. Um, when you get to Revelation and talk about the vision of the kingdom of God, it doesn't erase racial distinctions and ethnicities. In fact, it talks about every nation, tribe, and tongue. Every ethnos is present there. Uh, the, it, it's not like God is forming one big amorphous blob. No, the fullest expression of the image of God is this mosaic of ethnicities and cultures that that together form the most complete picture of the image of God. And so at the, I think at the, at the very basic level, um, racism is a denial of human dignity, but racism is ultimately an attack on, on God. When you attack an image bearer, you attack the image giver. You're, you're saying that what God has made is not good. And God has said and declared that what he has made is good. So ultimately, that's, that's really how human dignity uh, impacts the way we think about race. Yeah, there, there's just so many different issues, and we don't have time to go through them all, but it's a really thoughtful book. Um, 
on a, on a bunch of different issues from racism to abortion to immigration issues uh, to, to age discrimination. I thought that the story about uh, the, the pastor, that the church got rid of a guy in the band because he had gray hair. I thought that was, you know, elderly. Uh, I, I saw one author called Throwaway Culture. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of us just have looked at the last year and said, well, their lives don't matter because they're old. <laughs> um, could you touch on that briefly too? I mean, the, 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 the obsession with youth, I think is really kind of an issue in our society. Yeah, it is. And um, I'm very passionate about this. Uh, very passionate about this. Uh, and that chapter really, I loved writing because we talked about healthcare. We talked about how our views of the elderly populations, which I think since then, you know, with this, the, the COVID situation has really, I think, exposed some of the ways that we think about elderly populations. Um, also, the resurrection like the themes of the resurrection are foundational. And I want to talk about that in a second, if you have time, but, sure. um, how the resurrection really affects the way we think about human dignity. But when we talk about, um, uh, you know, worshiping youth, um, all of us would be against most Christians, if not all are against euthanasia, death with dignity, you know, uh, although I think we should oppose it with everything we have, because I do think it's a predatory culture that preys on on the elderly. But there's subtle ways in which we are functional Darwinists in that, in the way we see the elderly. I mean, just think about this. Um, just the way we think about our churches and are they, a lot of times we gear our churches toward the young. Now I understand like when we, when you revitalize a church, churches can be so inward focused. They can only target a dwindling population, an aging population, and they're out of touch with that generation, which is really bad. But at the same time, I, I look at a lot of the ch church growth stuff and a lot of the way that young churches and their vibe. And I wonder, are they communicating a subtle message that unless you are hip, unless you are put together, unless you are fashionable, we don't want you here. Um, and I tell the story in the book about a local church that I heard that had a great drummer, I think it was drummer or guitarist, I can't remember, on their team, on their praise team. And suddenly he was pulled off the praise team, not because his skills had diminished, not because he was a problem or anything, but because he had gray hair. And the comment was, this is not the look we're going for. <laughs> and it really made enraged me because I was thinking that's actually the look the kingdom of God is going for. And the church should be the one place in the world where you are not valued for simply for what you can bring to the church. And I think we need to think about this in our church bodies that there's a tendency for us pastors to say in our minds, you know, we, we want the young, healthy family that can tithe well, and he can serve on different committees and boards and be a future leader. But what about the person who I'm thinking about the person who has uh, Alzheimer's and can no longer really be functional in terms of leadership or contributions to the church who can basically come and sit there, maybe doesn't even know their wife's name. We should consider that person as valuable to us as the most feral, you know, young athlete. What about the Down syndrome, the child with Down syndrome? What about the autistic child that disrupts the service? Uh, the church should be the one place where we say you are valued because you are human, because you have dignity and worth. It should be the one place in society where you're not being evaluated and ranked based on what you can bring and give to the, uh, to the body. Your utility to society. Yeah. Your attractiveness. Your, yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, I want to end with away with words and online conversations because I think this is incredibly important. There are a lot of times where I think we're, we're faced with choices. I think politics always forces us to choi uh, choose between dignity. I mean, 
the conversation around separated children or race or abortion, a lot of this stuff is, these are big questions. And then you go and you vote once every four years or once every two years about this stuff. But it seems like now, because of the nature of online conversation, this is like ground zero for giving dignity, respect, grace, mercy to other people for most of our listeners, I would assume. Um, I may be wrong. I mean, how can we extend this to our online conversation and, and try to make these conversations less escalated and more uh, beneficial? Man, I'm glad you asked that. Really, I, I view away with words as kind of a companion volume to the Dignity Revolution in many ways, because um, there's so many ways that we can dehumanize people online. Uh, we tend to, part of the reason our discourse is so bad is that we, we are, and look, I'm someone who regularly uses social media, regularly uses Facebook, Twitter. I, I love it. But there are ways in which our conversations are mediated through a device. We don't have that embodied uh, experience. And it's because of that, we, we, we lose the humanity of the person we're disagreeing with. And we have to remind ourselves as Christians that when we're arguing or even talking to someone else online, we're not talking, we're, these are not avatars to be crushed. These are human beings made in the image of God. Um, and I think one of the things we have to remember when we're talking about things that um, remember that we're in public. Like I, I, I tell people to this, like, let's say you only have a hundred followers on Twitter or Facebook, which is fairly easy to do, or friends. Imagine yourself in a room full of 100 people. How would you speak and communicate? Let's yeah. say you have 10,000. Now you're talking a minor league baseball stadium. How about 100,000? You know, like you would speak differently if that person was in front of you. And even science shows that we are made and wired for embodied communication. We are made for this embodied, uh, our brains develop better when we are in community with each other. And I think the church has a role to play here. Uh, now, obviously we're in this COVID season, which is kind of weird for everybody, but we'll, we'll get back soon. But this, this COVID season is showing us how much we need community. I think a significant part of why we're so divided right now, it's not the only reason, or maybe not even the major reason, but it's a reason is because we have lost a lot of our gatherings. I mean, let's think about this, not just gathering the church on Sunday, but uh, you know, lions clubs and um, parent teacher meetings, Thanksgivings and Thanksgivings, schools. birthday parties, your, your wife drags you to that. You don't want to go to, <laughs> right. That you want to go end up to. chatting and talking to somebody and all these things have been taken away. And it's, we're just inside arguing on Facebook all day. And I think it's had a significant impact on our ability to see each other as human beings. Uh, it, but this is where I think the church can really speak into because the weekly gathering on Sunday, um, I talk about this, but like an analog church in a digital age that there's something about church life that's always going to be somewhat messy and analog, even though we have good technology with our sound systems and we have all kinds of stuff. And I don't like, I'm not anti-technology. I actually think technology is a, is a uh, part of subduing the earth. It's a part of obeying the creation mandate, but in a fallen world, it can, it can go sideways. That being said, there's something analog about church and messy that's good for us, right? Sitting there and the person behind us is singing off key, or you're in your small group and that other person rattles on forever about inane things, or um, the, the imperfections of your church service. You know, like you could probably get a a better sermon by staying home and listening to somebody that's really good and, pro and probably better music. But that's not the point of our worship. You know, the, the point of our worship is, is that embodied presence that is so good for us. And so I, I think as the world gets more digital, that's going to be increasingly more important. One of the silver linings of COVID, and I hesitate to say that because COVID has been just so devastating. One of the silver linings is I think there's a renewed appreciation for embodied gathering church was one of those feel about that yeah i agree because you know i work from home now 
and mm-hmm. I don't have that daily contact. And in some ways that's good because I've gotten, you know, some several hours back because people used to hang right. out in my office all the time. Uh, I get, I get more free time to spend with, you know, the family, you know, but I miss that connection. And so I, we haven't missed many church services this, this year, because it's the one time in the week where we are in a room with other people, except when we may go to the gym, like just being in a room with people, even if you aren't having conversations and like seeing human beings, it's just, you know, it's, it's water (laughs) when you're thirsty. Um, So I, I think it's really important. And I think buy stock in entertainment, in-person entertainment uh, things, because once things kind of go back to normal this year, it's going to be really important. I, I want to end, so. I want to end uh, with, uh, you, you mentioned the importance of the resurrection and dignity. What did you mean? Yeah. So I think a lot of Christians talk about human dignity and I think it's good that they're using that as a framework to, to say, well, how should I think about this issue or that? But I think we kind of have a service level of what it means. It just kind of means people have value and be nice to people. But really, you see the thin line uh, um, theme of human dignity run throughout Scripture. And um, we have a God who made us in his image uh, to image him, to represent him in the world because of sin. Uh, it has caused us, it has corrupted our humanity and caused us to turn in on one another, you know, uh, rebellion against the image giver also all, always results in um, harm to the, to image bearers. And it's just, that's just the result. You see that in the first family with Cain and Abel already it's, it's happening. Um, and then, you know, we turn in on each other, we worship ourselves or we turn against our neighbors but in um, Jesus, so so the gospel doesn't just the, the Christianity doesn't doesn't just give us a way how to think about hum, humans. It doesn't just diagnose what's wrong with the world. Why do humans so mean to each other and nasty to each other? What's wrong with me and and my issues? But it also gives us the solution for what ails the world. Uh, and so it gives us in Jesus someone who came to this earth not just as a spirit, but Jesus came as a human being. Jesus coming to this earth, the incarnation means that bodies are good. Human bodies have value. That God sent Jesus to live as a human being um, and to rescue. And Jesus not only rescues our souls, but he rescues our bodies. So in the resurrection of Christ, he not only proved that he is God, he not only uh, defeated sin and death in the grave, but he also, as Paul says, he's the first fruits of them that sleep, that it means that because he rose again, we too will rise, and our, we will rise on the last day, body and soul. Uh, This is a part of um, the gospel that I think a lot of Christians don't really fully grasp, that uh, that Jesus has rescued our bodies. That human bodies have value and they're good and they're and, and that God has, has has rescued them. And so when it helps us think about us as we deteriorate, as we get older, that um, one day we will have new bodies that will not break down. It helps us think about things like uh, health care and other things that we should care about human bodies because Jesus cared about human bodies. It helps us think about, it gives us an answer for things like euthanasia because someone who's wasting away, who has pain, um, who doesn't see a reason for living to say the answer, in a sense, all of us are in that position. All of us are groaning in our bodies, in our human bodies. And, but the answer is not, euthanasia, the answer is to wait for the redemption of our bodies. Um, It has answers for like transgender issues that, that those who have gender dysphoria, who are not at home in their bodies, there's a certain sense in which all of us are not fully at home in our bodies. We'd all like to, to be different. And that's because our bodies have been corrupted by the fall, but the answer is not, you know, 
surgery or all these solutions, but it's to wait for the redemption of our bodies. Right. So I, I think the resurrection ties into human dignity in such an important way that it doesn't just tell us that you, that humans are a value, but it tells us humans there's hope in rescue of our bodies through in Christ. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It does. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Again, The Dignity Revolution, Reclaiming God's Rich Vision for Humanity is the book. Also, Away With Words, Using Our Online Conversations for Good. You can learn more at danieldarling.com. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention his podcast, The Way Home. Uh, so make sure to check that out. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you for having me. These are great questions, things I love to discuss, and uh, just grateful for the work you're doing here, man. Well, thanks so much, and I'd love to have you back and, and just really appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thanks so much for listening here to The Chris Spangle Show, and we will see you again soon.